hope that everybody watched that record on the show because it, that's part of the experience of coming to Las Vegas every year if you're into ultra high performance audio. But the big place to do high performance audio is at the Venetian and the high performance audio exhibits at the Venetian are, are second to none. People send their most expensive equipment from all over the world to the Venetian for us to listen to. And uh, I'm going to have uh, Zach kick off, if, uh, if I could, here. Uh, what was a, your standout exhibit at the Venetian at uh, CES this year? Well, the very cool thing about the Venetian is, just like Peter said, uh, you know, the most well-known companies come out with their best and greatest, uh, their biggest debuts. So that's that's always a that's always a really you know unique and fun aspect to to uh, to witness here at CES. But uh, a standout for me, as it was a standout for me last year, is going to have to be the YG Acoustics uh, cable. I mean, it fits beautifully right between the Keypoint Series Two and the so new Sonya uh, flagship YG loudspeaker. Um, you could almost call it a baby Sonya. It has the same core design. Uh, it's actually, you can't see any screws on the back, no, you so can't. it's nope. an even slicker design. Uh, and that's, uh, that's again, from a physical aspect, um, kind of the trademarks of the Haley. But then, of course, you get to what really matters, which is the sonic attributions. And I think Peter can also attest that yeah. it's just a fantastic loudspeaker. And uh, it has all the YG trademarks, such as, you know, speed and transient response, uh, completely, you know, uncolored, uncolored sound because of their completely inert cabinets and the cabinet uh, materials that are used, which is aircraft grade aluminum. Yep. And yep. Uh, I mean, again, it's just a, another knockout from YG Acoustics, and uh, it was it was a very exciting debut this year. Yeah, I, I heard it uh, two days ago, and uh, it was a digital track playing, and. Uh, it just was the the room melted away, and right, exactly. the, just, the layering of the images, the tonality was spot on. And then there was a little digital glitch, and one of the operators of the system ran over, mortified that uh, that he thought that the demo was going bad. And it was really one of the top five demos I heard in the Venetian this year. And uh, I think Miles even had it in his notes as one of the top two. Didn't you, Miles? If I'm not mistaken, no, it was in a top couple. Top but, couple, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was up there. I liked it. You know. It was definitely it's it was a smaller sounding Sonya. Yeah. Um, not right. quite as big yeah. sounding, yeah. but um, my only th I thought it was great through the mid range and top. I thought the cool. bass, you know, again bass at the show is what it is. It's the bass what was it a is. little yeah. thick yeah. and, and yeah. it lost a little bit mm -hmm. of the detail mm -hmm. in the bass, but mm -hmm. you know that that has to be you know the room and there's only so much you can do in a showroom. But you know I listen only to analog, so you know. Those guys there love me when I come in. It's like, what record do you have? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't remember who it was came over and did you bring you know Sunday meets the Hawk uh, records? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I brought something just as good. But yeah, I mean, Dan Zamps really, you know, he's made a oh, big. Oh yes, his, his yeah, new amps yep, definitely yep, have made yeah. a, a big change. They're not like the right. old Krell amps. I mean, they still have Dan's trademark on it. You know, you know his handiwork. But they're definitely, you know, an amp. They were on the Vienna acoustics. They mm -hmm. sounded really, really good. Mm -hmm. They sounded really good on the YG. They did on the Sonys last year. So, mm -hmm. you know, that is something that really struck me as part of the room, plus the turntable in there. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. exactly. I mean, the synergy between Dan D'Agostino's momentum amplifiers and the YG loudspeakers. Well, yeah, plus I think it's a good that, match, yeah. No, plus the YG to me have made huge strides. I mean, right. what yes. they're yeah. what they're selling today in no way, shape, or form resembles what they were selling three years ago. Right, they've gotten rid of that sound. I mean, I couldn't listen to the YGs a couple of years ago. I mean, the only way you could do it was with the tenors, which kind of rolled the upper octaves. <laughs> off. Mm -hmm. But you know, like two years ago, they redesigned. I don't care what they claim, they made changes to it. <laughs> Did it really made a significant impact in the sound? And they're a completely different speaker. I agree with that, and. Uh, I, I they say the same thing to me. Well, it's pretty much the same speaker. It's uh, pretty much the same crossover. It's not. Yeah. It's, it, it's really the Sonya 1.3. I reviewed uh, extraordinary loudspeaker. 
uh, via not its predecessor. It's voiced I, differently. Yeah, I don't care what you say. Yeah, it is yeah. voiced differently. Well, there's a major difference because it's a passive loudspeaker. Right. You and that really does make a big difference. There's a different load and draw on the preamplifier with a passive loudspeaker. Uh, you have a, a different a cabinet shape to it. There's different cabinet thicknesses to it. Different uh, drivers. Di their forge core. Yeah, forge core. They have uh, the, the the bevels on the side of the uh, of the of the front of the loudspeaker are more curved. Uh, the whole look of the loudspeaker, it looks like almost a fine German automobile. And it's, you're getting a lot yeah. more out of the speaker for the money if you look at what they sold yeah. for. I mean, yeah. it's an expensive yeah. speaker, it's $42,000. Yeah, $2, yeah you're right. Yeah. But if you look what the other speaker was for 40000 that they sold, and right. this for 40000 you're getting a lot more bang for your buck. Oh, Agreed. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Well, I'm going to go in, uh, if I don't mind piping up, I want to pipe up of the, of the most awesome thing I've ever seen in audio at an audio show in my life. And, I think uh, I know what you're going to say. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the magical ultimate I loudspeaker I is the most unbelievable oh, yes. thing I've ever seen in my whole audio career. It stands as tall as I am, plus half of me. That's, I mean, it's that big. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, you see pictures of these things. Uh, you've seen them on the Magico site, and you've seen a couple reviewers from the publications that have visited Magico, and they take snapshots. Guys, well, what I want to say is, all you guys out there who have seen the horn speakers out of Asia, where they yeah. build them into the, into the wall yeah, and yeah, into yeah, the floors, yeah. these don't give anything up to those no, they Asian don't. horn speakers. No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> they don't. And then they're they're machine. They're, they're machine. Out of, uh, the mid bass horn oh. is like you could put a body inside. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they had it displayed behind velvet, uh, rope offs, and I walked around the corner and because it's in the it's separate... Like a museum. I, yeah. I, I, it's a museum piece. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I, I had a lone wolf stand, jump over the, the barrier barricade and uh, stand next to it, so and then reach his hand up and touch it so you can get a feel for uh, what a man looks like next to this mm -hmm. unbelievable loudspeaker. It's a $600,000 loudspeaker. Uh, they have to make two pair at a time. It is unbelievably visually striking, and I have to get out before uh, before my audiophile days are, are gone <laughs> and go and listen to that thing. Yeah. Just awesome. Just statement, statement product. Uh, Miles, okay, give us another room. Well, the room that was at the top of my list was the Focal Grand Utopia yep. EMs. You know, last year they debuted that new woofer technology that helped mm -hmm. control the woofer. I think they got a big 15-inch mm -hmm. woofer in the mm -hmm. speaker. It's a mm -hmm. big, huge, huge speaker. Mm -hmm with the back IQ amps with the self-biasing, which keeps the bias constant over wherever the tube is operating, which is a pretty amazing thing. The amps aren't cheap. They're under, I think, 16,000 a pair. The speakers are 180. Mm -hmm. Kevin mm -hmm. debuted his new statement line stage, statement phono stage, and the thing that struck me about them is he put a glass top on it, and I could see why he did it, because it's beautiful on the inside, it and it's beautiful on the, on the outside. I mean, it's just like, you want to see this. This is like a museum piece inside, not like some of these things that you see on the internet that looks like a rat's nest of wires right. soldered in, <laughs> inside. It's like, you go, holy crap, this thing's going to blow up, right? I mean, it's beautiful looking. They have the uh, trans rotor cable yep. with the, I think it was an airtight Supreme cartridge on it. Of course, I didn't listen to the digital, so whenever I talk today, it's about the analog side. But big speakers, big sound. What two things that struck me? I put on Alan Parsons' iRobot. What really blew me away is it's a really densely orchestrated recording. Alan Parsons' Hallmark, and it's separated. You could really hear everything that was going on in the tracks. Number two, I put on my ten-dollar special that I found at Twisted Shout in Denver at Glass Rocky Mountain Show of Ella sings Jobim. Put on the Desafinado cut. Listen to her. It was. Just about the only system there that didn't veil her voice. Her, she wow. was there in the room. I put wow. on the Telefunken quad limit. The, vo the vocalists are all in the back of the stage. There's about eight to ten of them. They're all there. So you like the system? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it blew me away. I mean, it was really, really good. And you know, my only complaint I could complain about. I mean, obviously we can always pick, but it just looked like, slightly reticent. It just didn't quite have the balls, you know, whatever that was due to, but I mean, that was still, for show sound, was extraordinary. Um, how about Zach, another room other than YG? I love going Mr. into... Mr. YG. <laughs> <laughs> I love going into the TAD room. 
Um, first of all, because it's such a structured demo with Andrew Jones just completely, yeah. you know, introducing every track, you know, kind of giving an overall, you know, very cohesive demo to everyone that goes in. But uh, besides that, I mean, the sound of his loudspeakers. The morning that I went in, he had his uh, Evolution 1 uh, floor standing loudspeakers hooked up to the system. And he dubbed it the car audio system because it basically um, is worth what a car would <laughs> it's be worth what, today, a car. what an average car yeah. costs. Mm -hmm. A Tesla? Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but again, I mean, with his music selection and with his uh, just overall charisma, I mean, that whole demo just comes together. And his loudspeaker, the Evolution 1, is such a fantastic loudspeaker, especially for the mid-range up. And uh, again, like Peter was saying, it's not that loud of a large speaker, so in the room that it was in, it didn't overpower the room. Mm -hmm. It had a good coupling to the room, so mm -hmm. that, again, goes in aid to a, to a, to a good uh, sonic presentation of the product. Uh, so that's really a loudspeaker and a room that stood out to me this year. Just from the mid-range up, it had that clarity, that, per that uh, just well-presented, well-composed um, sound staging to it. Uh, mid-range uh, clarity was also uh, fantastic. He played a couple of uh, choral pieces that really kind of showed off that a attribute. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just another room that I thought was uh, pretty, pretty outstanding. Great, Zach. Well, Zach, I got to take from there and go, yeah, smaller format speaker. Uh, the Broadman this year, there's a smaller Broadman speaker, and it was it's about that big. And it was hooked up with the Thrax which is a Belgian-based company that makes outstanding hybrid uh, amplifiers. And this, the sound of uh, the one track we, we played, which is the whole, it filled the whole side of the room with an ambient sound field that I found really extraordinary. It was just a, a standout room. And you know why? Because the speaker was smaller. The smaller the speaker, the less it interferes with the room notes. Better imaging. Better, you got it, better imaging. And you know, I've heard Broadman's before, and they sound very good, but this was special. How about you, Miles? Another speaker, maybe a smaller speaker. Okay, I'll throw one out, and then I'll get to another speaker. Okay, okay. Uh, the new Rayho X1, oh, with the roll yeah. in. Oh, Unfortunately, yeah. there was no analog in the room, but <laughs> on my blog, when I wrote up the Rayho bike, it's $7,200, and what I said is it does what a small speaker should do, and it's all a yay, yay, yay with, yeah. a, with yeah. a two yeah, way exactly, driver exactly. with a ribbon and a ceramic driver, yeah. Yeah. but it just disappears. Everything is kind of like the old British speakers, except without all the British colorations. Very quick, top yeah. end is just yeah. you know, extends out forever. Decent low end, as long as you don't push the speaker too much. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it just like everything between the speakers, around the speakers, above the speakers, yeah. Yeah. It, it's. Yeah, Quite it's a little speaker. It's a, it's a great solution for any size listening space. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, on the internet, there's a, a we're a member of a, of, a, of a forum called What's Best Forum, and there's a guy that posts up there, his, his name is, his trade name on the, on the forum is Wizard, and he posts up these pictures of all over the world of all these crazy audio systems, and there was this one guy in, uh, in Asia, uh, obviously a, a high net worth design room, uh, lots of sound treatment in the room. It was huge, this huge giant room. And what did he have in the room? A little pair of Magicoms. And, you know, he was he, and he was said, well, I'm not sure I like these better or the Q7s. So, you know what, you think about that. Man that can afford anything, he's not sure if he likes a little Magicos or the Q7s. And you got to say that's similar to the Rido. The Rido, the small new Rido, it's at the X1, I think the model number yes. is? Yeah, X1. It has the same tweeter as the D1. And the D1's being raved about and by a lot of magazine writers. And I think that the, the Rido, I think that Michael Borenson from Rido is just a, a, a very good designer with matching that fast, fast tweeter with whatever size woofer he's using down below. So, yeah. So, on the magic yeah. note, Okay, go. I don't want to stir up a hornet's nest. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. I, I smell trouble. But. Magicos come out with their S series as yes. opposed to their Q series. So one room I wanted to talk about was the Opsolari room okay. with the S fives. Okay. And basically, I heard I've heard the same system in New York at the dealer who brought it out. The speakers are totally broken in. They got about 200 hours. I think they recommend five or 700 hours at least. Right. So, but anyway, they had essentially the same system at Rocky Mountain with the Rockport speakers, and I thought it was horrible. 
at Rocky Mountain. Congested. It just sounded like the amps could not didn't have enough juice for the speakers. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I'm right or not, but it just it had that feel. You know, sometimes when you lose the dynamics and, and everything, the first thing is like this yeah. is just you know it's not a good match. Yeah. They had the same system this year with the S5s, the Absolari. Steve Dobbins, the beat, I forget the, what's the turn table, uh, the tone yeah, arm. With the yeah, the tone arm is, uh, that's a, a, Sh- a Frank Schroeder. Schroeder, yeah, Schroeder Frank, Sh- and Frank Atlas, Schroeder. the all Nick Fono stage. It was wonderful. Mm-hmm. The, sec- the third day, it, it was even more transparent. It was like a whole different system. The only thing is, slightly dynamically reticent, but as I said, 200 hours on the speaker, so I'm not going to pick on that, because that clearly could be why. But it was just, you know, that, that Absolari sounded like really, really clean, really single-ended, what is it, like 45 watts single-ended. Yep, it yep. just was effortless. It sounded beautiful. Everything was there. Well, it's interesting you say that because I gave a Gold Sound Award to the Absolari room at Rocky Mountain. I heard it on a different day than Miles did. Somebody must have jostled the cable because they played Four Duke for me, and I was lost. It was just like to die for. It was like so accurate from top to bottom. I was in love with it. So I, I go, I guess it was a different day at CES, and I heard the Absolari system of uh, at the Venetian, and I heard that it had enough drive for the Magic Ghost, but I heard a little thickness in the lower mid-range upper bass. Perhaps it was a track, or perhaps somebody, again, jostled something, changed the cable. Yeah, that's what we do. We, we think we have it good, right. and then we go and do something, because we go, you know what? I have it good. I have all these people well, coming into the room. And settling in. It's breaking. That's, that's right. right. That's, that speaker's breaking that's in. That's right. That's right. That's right. But, you know, us as audio, as audio of vile nutcases, it's, it's, more ne- it's never good enough. So or it doesn't now, matter. Yeah, that's that we can go no. across the hall where you had the same speakers with Zandon, which I will yeah, go to yeah, in a second. Yeah, yeah, but I want yeah, to return okay. to the Q versus S series. Okay. Yeah. This, okay. Obviously, there's a okay. lot of talk about who yeah. likes what. Yeah. And, yeah. and to me, and not to get on Alon's S list, Uh-oh. but but basically, to me, I prefer the S series because to me, the Qs then they had the Q threes, I think, down in the MIT room with the brand new, never seen before spectral, mm-hmm. S, was it S300 reference mm-hmm. or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. The Q series plays notes, the S series stands for soul. Oh. There's just soul to the music with the mm-hmm. S series that, you know, whenever I hear the Q series, it's detailed, it's clean, it's linear, but it doesn't speak to me. And the other thing I want to mention about the Zandon room, I just wanted to bring this up, is this to me was, if I had one, you're going to say, what's my one take home? Okay. I was talking to the guys from Zandon, because this predates the show. This is kind of an interesting story. We were having a debate between Eric Files, who's the distributor in the U.S. for Zandon, and myself about using the right equalization curves on our records. And he was maintaining that the Sheffield directed disc were cut using an EMI curve, not what was supposed to be the standard RIAA. And I said, well, I don't know about that, but all I can say is Sheffields have always sounded funky to me. So I can, I, so anyway, I, thanks. thanks to Facebook, wrote Doug Sachs a note mm-hmm. on the TML Mastering mm-hmm. Facebook page, mm-hmm. and Doug was nice enough to reply, I said, no, they're not RAAA, they're cut on the DIN slash Teldec curve. Mm-hmm. So we were like, okay, so we're going to come back to the show now, and we're going to bring the Sheffields, we're going to bring a few other records, and Zandon had introduced their new... I think it's 120 yeah. solid state phono you stage can switch. with five yeah. EQ curves. Five EQ curves, right? yeah. So you got yeah. our, you got uh, Deca, Columbia, RIAA, Teldec, and Columbia. So you got five curves. They got at least two pages already. They've gone through front and back. What should be the curve for the label? Whether it's in or out, absolute phase. I don't know who's done this, but it's a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> and so essentially, we went there. We listened to the Sheffields, and sure enough, it was a little better. Okay, you can listen, you can hear a little more detail, it was a little more in focus, it was maybe a little less phasey, so it was quieter. So then we said, okay, so let's go to some other record. And we pulled out Alan Parsons' I, Robot, which is Arista. So we went first, R-I-A-A, then what they suggested, E-M-I. The difference was day and night. It wasn't subtle like with the Sheffield, but it was day and night. And it was like there were textures there, there was a filling in in the mid bass to what was there in the low bass, everything was there. Then we went to a three blind mice, again, a little subtler, mm-hmm. not as big a difference, but it definitely was there. So I guess the take home message I wanted to talk about is like when we're dealing with analog, we've got a real hierarchy now that we really have to start to think about. It, no one even knows why they're not RIAA, because it was supposed to be standardized back in the late 50s, but obviously it isn't. 
And so, obviously, we've got a hierarchy where obviously the first thing needs to be is getting the cartridge alignment correct, okay? So we need to get the zenith, we need to get that azimuth, we need to get the tracking force right. But now, I think we really have to like start to reassess things, like everything we've been doing in terms of setting the SRA slash VTA may be totally wrong. Because everything that we're trying to correct with that, you hear exactly when we switch to loading. Mm -hmm. And so now the next thing is, well, if we go and backtrack and do load, and before we do the loading or before we set the SRA, VTA, mm -hmm. we need to set the EQ curve. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to and now it's going to be a big question: What does it analog sound like when we do the second thing, which is selecting the right EQ curve? Well, that brings up a good point, and Zan is going to address it right now. And there's going to be more to come about that. And there are a few, yeah. and there are a few bonus sections out there. I had played with the Olnik. I wasn't as successful with the Olnik as it was with the, the, the Zandon, but there are a couple of other you know, photo sections now that are coming out with that. So it's going to be another thing to consider, although it's still easier than I, digital. I, I don't use the word <laughs> consider. I think another thing to obsess over. <laughs> That's a good, good. Well, like thanks, it. Miles. Again, more to talk about, more controversy afoot or in the future uh, with record playback. Um, Zach, how about another room? Um, I would have to say the MBL room. Oh, even yeah. though their electronics were, according to them, uh, not broken fresh. in, fresh, in a fresh, fresh. fresh. I like that word, fresh. Um, uh, driving the 111Fs, I actually thought that it sounded as effortless as an MBL should sound, or what we've come to expect from MBL. I mean, sound station was just you know off the charts again. Uh, and again, I mean, it was a, it was an excellent room to go into. Um, it really, again, it was the music just hung for, in a black background, so that that's always wonderful to hear from them. And it, of course, their electronics look fantastic, uh, especially some of their bigger stuff that they've you know have had at previous shows. I like to say that they're the big German chocolate bars because you know? uh, they have white chocolate, dark chocolate. I mean, it, it's pretty fantastic. And they violated our law. I restarted that it was an empty show. Whenever I went in there, I could never get to hear them because they were packed. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a nice. Uh, that was a nice, a nice, a uh, nice thing to hear. But uh, again, I mean, the room just sounded fantastic. Again, it was another room where the loudspeaker was very well coupled to the room. Yeah, you know, they, and, the 111 uh, did couple well. Right, the right. Yeah. Um, yep. They normally have the extreme, you know, system in there with the subwoofer stacked up on top of each other. And of course, that's very all and impressive. But this year, I really thought that it was a nice balanced. Uh, presentation. Uh, you know, that's so. a good point. Balanced presentation. Right. They didn't have the gigantic amplifiers that you need five people to pick <laughs> the up. The chocolate bars. That's right. Well. As, as Zach calls them the chocolate bars because they come in white or they come in dark chocolate. White chocolate and dark chocolate. <laughs> uh, they had a new Noble Line amplifier. Uh, right. And uh, it, again, fresh off the blocks, fresh off uh, fresh off the getting the board soldered in. So that to get the sound they did, it was effervescent, it was holographic. I also heard chamber music. And I was very moved by it. Yeah, I thought it was exactly, exquisite. It was, exactly. it was exquisitely beautiful. And it had signature MBL sound. It, it's like being at your own it was for personal concerts. Yeah, yeah. Miles, uh, how about another room? How about, now, how about the pass room? Yeah, I have to say, I was shocked. I mean, it's the best sound that I've heard from Nelson's room ever at a show. Whoa. Um, they introduced the new .8 series, which yeah. is be yeah. goes between the .5 and the XS. It's a little more expensive, but they, you know, it should be a lot more for the money. Although I must admit that Wayne did chide me a little bit because my focus was directed in their room, not to what they were selling, but to what they didn't sell, which was that beautiful remade Techniques SP10 Mark II with the Micro CK 505 arm that those guys have rebuilt. It was just like drop dead gorgeous. And that's what we were listening to. But again, it was like just very. They were using the Sony speakers. A little lack of resolution. A little lack of this or that. But you know, you could listen to it all day long. It did not sound solid state. It did not sound like doom. It just sounded like music. Yeah, I think the design goal of the Point Eight series is to add that spaciousness of the top level series, the uh, XS, if, I'm, if I got the yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah the right, XS. Right. So there's the XS being, uh, being brought down into the into the world of point five, creating something that's neither the XS or the, or the point five something that 
approaches the XS and it's something new in itself. So it's a, a beautiful sounding amplifier, uh, perfect balance from top to bottom. Uh, Zach, what did you think? Um, I really like the design that they brought down. It looks exactly like an SF XS, but more compact. Um, so again, the same radial dial that you would find on an XS yeah. was brought down, uh, of course, smaller in size. But um, I really like the uniformity of design because, again, that's really what that product was meant to come out for yep. in the middle of the X.5 and the XS. So it was, it was, a, it was, it was very, very, very cool to be this year. Yeah. The other room that I really thought was nice was the PTL with the Alexia. Yeah, yeah that they had two of the nicest room. people in the industry, yeah. Luke and B there, yeah. and they were always like yeah. so helpful. And I have to say that the first couple of times that they had the Alexia, especially at the rollout at Rocky Mountain, I was very disappointed in the sound. I mean, I had listened to some stuff that I knew that I had brought, and you know, it was shouty, and I'm going, you know, this is not a Wilson speaker, you know? Mm -hmm. And it sounded a little better last year at Rocky Mountain. And I said, yeah, this is starting to sound better, but this year they had it with the VTLs, and. I have to say that this is a speaker that speaks to me, so to speak. There you go. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, it's saying buy me. <laughs> 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 but the one thing that really impresses me is kind of like what I interpret as a lack of distortion in this speaker. It's just silky smooth. I mean, it just goes away. It does. You do not feel ever like there's a speaker there in the roof reproducing mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. It really goes away. That's a great, great uh, accolade uh, for uh, and to Wilson Audio. Well, we've uh, we've experienced so many things at the, at the shows. We we could sit here and talk all day. We could sit. In fact, audiophiles like to talk. Sometimes I swear, audiophiles like to talk where they do listen. Well, I'm and taking the red eye. We have really <laughs> Okay, one product you take home with you quick fast. Oh. That, that you could have shipped and fit into your house. So you know that takes out the magic out of the... What would I take home? Um, okay. I would like to take home, even though I just got the VPI, I wouldn't mind taking home an Air Force uh, One. Okay. I'll take home the, the new Jadi turntable. Zach? Uh, I'd actually love to take home the new Dan D'Agostino Andrea amplifier. Oh, you know, why yeah, did you ask for a lot, are yeah, you? Yeah, you ask for a lot. Well, the shot, you turn table. But, uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, Peter Bruninger and Miles Astor here from yeah. CES 2014. And Zach Galarza. Uh, all, we're all reporting here. Uh, we want to wish everybody a what? A happy 2014. Happy 2014. Happy New Year, everyone. Our best from avshowrooms.com.